She remains unstarted. All because exhaust. All right, so the little um, block here, I've got it mounted kind of loosely. I did check, make sure it would clear the throttle body and make sure it clears when the thing's on. Everything is clearing, it looks like. So down here, that silver fitting right there, that's gonna tee into that brake booster line. That's right here, this one. And uh, but further on down, so it'd be more of a straight shot. Uh, then these are 90 off. I've got uh, four ports plus the boost pressure port, so that would have been one that I used on the other one. That's why I needed five, and so now I don't need it because it's an electronic signal being sent back to the gauge. Okay, wow. Well. All right, so the splice is right there. And I got it going over here to the bottom on a 90. This isn't tightened up all the way yet. I'm gonna leave it loose in case I gotta fish these, uh, kind of have a difficulty with that. And then of course, just leaving it loose for now. And then, yeah, I can ride this up over here like this. Shouldn't be a problem. And then all the other ports on here will end up getting used. So yeah. That's pretty much it. I might even bring it over here somewhere or something like that. Once all these hoses get on there. Ah, we're still fishing it through. AC compressor's on. I don't have it hooked up because I want to take it to work and let them charge it and everything for me. Um, and then make sure that this thing, the fans are coming on. In other words, do like a diagnostic on it because the last thing I want is for this safety valve to pay off. And then, of course, it's spewing pag oil and dye everywhere so I don't want that I'm no expert wrapping these things so I hope I'm doing it right I've seen some videos on YouTube where they overlap them quite like maybe only a quarter of an inch or half an inch they overlap it down I don't know what the benefit would be with that because that's not what they say on the directions at least what I read um, the directions don't even tell you so I think once you get like one single layer on here, that should be enough to do what they have engineered it to do. So but anyway, so that's the first one that's on there. This is going to be sitting upside down like that. And then I still got that one and that one to do. Man, I think I'm going to like that. Yeah, it gives a little color. Kind of shining off of the painted deal here. I like it. Continuing on. Yeah, a little tedious to work with in the curves, but yeah, I like it. It does add color to the bay. So, yeah. All right, so all done. So yeah, this pipe section, it goes down of course this connects to there and then this goes down down to the intercooler so any heat that we're going to get from the engine and transmission would be transmitted within relative proximity to these pipes and that's why I'm doing it and uh, yeah I think that's it so okay so I'm gonna get all the vacuum tubing hooked up then I'm going to take, so this piping isn't going on here right now. I'm going to actually get the vacuum tubing routed, break, uh, T into the brake booster line. And once I get this all situated back, because you got to kind of meander down through here and down to that. To, you can barely see the intercooler pipe, pipe sticking out right there. So I've got to get that tubing through that hole and... I don't remember. Anyway, geez. Okay, so, so yeah. All right. So just some things, just buttoning up. I had to reroute all this piping and stuff. 
And this time, because that vacuum block was pointing up that way, no, it wasn't hitting. But, of course, when the engine revs, it revs toward the firewall, drops back down. And as it comes back down, it might move a little past where it was resting at before it lifted. And I don't want it hitting that. Uh, mainly, it's not going to hurt anything, but it's just the noise, you know. So what I did was I just clocked the blow-off valve from where it used to be up underneath the pipe to this side here. The, the EGR valve's not there any longer. So, and I got the, the vacuum block all situated inside here. I've got one port I'm not using. The fuel pressure regulator's hooked up. Um, the blow-off valve's hooked up. The vacuum that goes to the EVAP purge solenoid, it's hooked up. Um, we've got a port going over to the brake boosters vacuum signal, so we got that. Yeah, the go the go reflective again. It's more on there for utility for utility purposes rather than looks, but it doesn't look half bad. Um, so I've got to just put on a couple more clamps, get everything else situated. Um, but yeah, we're very close to firing it up got to add the fluids I want to disconnect the fuel like I said and let the line kind of purge uh, as well as the engine oil from the return so I'll be doing that from down below no big deal just crank it over you'll unhook the connector at the ignition coil and you'll unhook your uh, you'll disconnect you take out your uh, fuel injector fuse because you don't want fuel going in there or in the spark you just want it to crank and uh, we'll crank it Now I've got oil lines going from here all the way back to the turbo through the return back up here so I'll have to crank quite a bit just to see some oil I'm sure and to run some fresh oil through there I want to do it till it's clear uh, short of that I think we'll be good I'll double check once I get it up and running I'll double check the fuel pressure hook up the fuel pressure gauge over there and check the fuel pressure, see where we're at uh, off base. I'll have to set the base pressure. Um, that hasn't been toyed with running the 12 pounds, so it shouldn't need any augmentation, but we'll see. You just gotta kinda be careful. Uh, next, I'll be sipping those wheels off uh, to get them um, bronzed. I want bronzed colored wheels. Um, but short of that, man, I think everything's okay. And then after that, I'm going to take it out for a drive. I don't necessarily have to have the hood on. Oh, one other thing I need to do. I need to set up the um, uh, catch can. So dealing with uh, catch cans on these things. Now, I went and looked up the STS catalog on how to incorporate um, the PCV system or how to, how to augment the PCV system with... Uh, a rear mount turbo and what they what they do is in their kits they include a valve like this which is a three port it's a two-way basically shut valve and then a pressure switch now this the one they su supply is a hob switch it's a little more simplistic this one here was I think I was going to use it for uh, for timing some some such I, I forgot but but it is a pressure switch and you can adjust it there's a little adjuster screw right there and you wire this to turn this off and on or open and close it based on the pressure it sees now for whatever reason and if I, I, you know this obviously channel is made for Saturn's S series in particular but if you were to have a mass airflow controlled car then this would be the system you'd have to run. And that part number, it's a standard part number, it's Frank Victor 1 Tom. And you're gonna need this because, uh, because it's a mass airflow system. And of course, mass airflow measures the mass of air coming in. And of course, the computer's gonna add fuel appropriately to that based on its tables. Any air introduced after that, the computer can't electronically see it, so it can't add fuel for it. And then, cause all kinds of problems. So all this time, 
of course I made my own kit, but I was, I don't know where I found it at, but I, I found the, uh, STS turbo install guide and using that, I, I used a lot of the, like what size piping to use from the turbo back and, and, and the piping feeding the turbo, the exhaust. And, and I, and I kept to that because of spool and things like that. The only thing I didn't use, obviously, was the turbo they would have recommended for my size engine and application. But, but in that kit, I thought I didn't read it all the way like I should have because I went ahead and hunted all over for one of these. Now, they supply their own, but they, they got this sticker off, and they put their own STS turbo sticker on. But I suspect it's the exact same part. Uh, the only difference was, like I said, Hobbs switch versus this switch. So... So anyway, if you have a mass airflow car, you need it. But I just now read in the manual, I missed this the first time around, was if you have a MAP vehicle, uh, manifold absolute pressure, which we do, then, well, you don't need any of this. What you would need, and I've already got myself covered, is that ch as the uh, PCV. It's, there's a check valve in there. All PCVs have a check valve but the one that comes stock with the Saturn isn't strong enough to overcome the boost uh, that, because think about it, you know, under atmospheric pressure, it's 14.7 PSI, just atmospheric pressure. Whereas here we're adding 12 pounds to that and we will be adding a total of 20 coming up. So you need, now that check valve is off a of Mazda 3, a Mazda Speed 3, uh, so basically any car that has a decent amount of boost being pushed to it factory The PCV valve on it should be able to use it if it's the same size and whatnot as what you got and this one is So I put that on there and uh, Just because I realized uh, a while back. It wasn't through anything that I read in that uh, STS manual was that you're going to need to block the boost that's coming into here and I already kind of blew into the factory uh, PCV and it it wasn't holding hardly anything and I know I can't blow very much so I, I went ahead and swapped that out just because it made sense to so here we are and all he says in, in his guide is that you need to make sure that you have something that will block off like, a, like I just described and then you can just have a vent filter here that's it one of those little PCV vent filters but I hate those things. I hate them for a couple reasons. One is any vapors and stuff that come out of there. They, you know, if it's enough and some cars do generate quite a bit, it looks like you got an issue. Uh, you'll be having a little vapor smoke coming up from underneath your hood. It's kind of embarrassing. So the second reason I hate it is because ultimately they get dirty and clogged up and then they stop venting like they should. And you got to replace them. And uh, lot, some of them will drip oil out of them and things like that. So I wanted to install a catch can. And so I did. Now, what was kind of curious to me was not once did I have hardly anything getting into this catch can. And I said, well, that, that can't be right. I mean, I've seen these catch cans installed on cars and, and uh they regularly have to, you know, change them out. If not every oil change, you need to kind of, you know, empty them. And uh, mine wasn't doing anything. This one here has the convenience of having like a little dipstick tube on it. This is one of those old cheapy ones off of Amazon. You know, I wanted silver. They got them in all kinds of colors. But it's got its own little deal. The only thing I did differently on this one is I added some... Um, kind of some it kind of looks like chain mail it's made by scotch bright and it just it looks like it's just a like a ball of this like almost like steel wool kind of but it's it's kind of it looks like a bunch of little chains in there and the reason you want it like that is so the the, the gases can flow through it while at the same time these are designed to kind of knock the oil out of the vapor suspension and let it settle to the bottom of the the catch can you don't need much and i don't have much in here but that's the reason i do it so i've had it set up like this since i've had it and of course 
I was thinking the whole time that maybe I needed to add that valve and that uh, that pressure switch, but but again, that's for mass airflow cars. So he's saying that all you need to do is add that vent filter right here. So not wanting that, okay, well, what do most people do? They can either vent it or they can catch catch it. And so I incorporated this catch can. Now the I is for in, the O is for out. I put those in there myself, but that is the way that the, the, the thing has it labeled for whatever reason, because, and I don't know why, because I've actually taken these hoses off and blew in and the, the air will go this way and it'll go that way. There's no rhyme or reason. So just now I took this hose off and I blew into it. And when I let off, it blew back. The air kind of blew back. And I, and I told myself, well, that's because, you know, Yes, I'm blowing air into basically a sealed engine, and it's going to kick it back. It's going to flow it back. The way I'm, well, I've done this, and I think I've actually had it right, but being that I wasn't catching anything in here, a couple things. One, I must have little to no blow-by happening. So, you know, whenever you do a turbo motor, and I, and I did this motor this way, you gap your rings a little bit more uh, than you would if it was an A, so that when the thing heats up from from just operating and then of course with boost the the rings will close off it gives them room to kind of expand and close off uh, or you know not close off entirely obviously but that's the whole reason you do boosted engines different nitrous engines different and uh so there should be plenty of plenty of gap in there i mean and again i'm not blowing directly into the cylinder i'm blowing into the cam cover which has the relief holes that go all through the block and engine down into the oil pan so it's not like i'm blowing into the cylinders and they're fighting against you know whatever pressure i'm putting in there kind of like when you go to turn the engine over when you got your spark plugs in there and stuff like that it's kind of hard but when you take them out you take the spark plugs out now it gets easier i was thinking that as well that that's impossible so but the way i have it set up normal pcv on the saturn engine is you have the check valve up there, the PCV valve, and then you have a hose that goes from here up to into the uh, intake tube. And so at idle, you, you're, 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 you're in vacuum, right? So the PCV valve, it opens, and since there's a filter on the stock setup right here, the air is coming through here, it's continuing on into the motor, while at the same time, the engine's vacuum through the PCV is sucking fresh air into this tube into the crankcase to mix the vapors. That's at idle. When you accelerate, the PCV valve shuts off. You're obviously still getting air from your filter into your intake tube. And now any crankcase pressure that is being built up inside here, blow by, that's coming through this hose where normally it was flowing this way, now it's coming out this way and being sucked in with a venturi effect to help push it into the engine to be reburned. Basically, you know, doing what it's supposed to do, positive crankcase ventilation. Now, now, okay, so now we're boosted. Not only that, we're boosted with a rear mount system. So, thinking logically, I'm good here especially now because I've got the, the stronger check valve in there to control from boost coming back into here. So this is the real question. So at idle, this thing is doing exactly what it would do in A, okay? Air is being drawn back through the filter at the back of the car, and there's a nipple in between the filter and the turbo right in the middle, okay? This, this, this would be my nipple. So air is being filtered first, then it's being drawn back up here, should be coming here, which then goes into here. This is at idle, mind you. And with the PCV valve open, it's sucking air through there. And of course, feeding it to the motor at the same time. So fresh air is coming in, feeding the engine's needs and being sucked in through here, back through the PCV valve, and Bob's your uncle. Under boost, well, 
the same scenario would happen. So now the air coming in here is pressured, makes the check valve close because now air is coming this way. It's trying to fight it from coming this way. What's happening here? Blow by. So this blow by should come out here, go into the can, right? Here's inlet, out, back to the nipple at the air filter. There, air is rushing by, causing a venturi effect, sucking this air that's being fed back this way in, back up this way, back into the motor. So that's my thinking on it. I don't think I'm wrong. And because it's a map car, I don't have to worry about unmetered air being sucked in here. And I don't, I don't need that valve and that pressure switch. So that's been, you know, this, that was just my curiosity this whole time. I think I've had it right this whole time, but here I am and just just had me thinking now when when i was just now when i blew in this nipple and it it allowed me to blow but it came right back or not all of it i'm sure but some came so that tells me that the volume of air that i was blowing was more than what the flow ability there of this engine upper engine could handle and some of it came back out while at idle, I'm sucking in air that this thing can handle. Plus, there's vacuum assist, right? There's vacuum assist being that is happening from being at idle, the vacuum, which is going to be sucking it in rather than trying to fight me blowing it in. So I think I'm good. I, if you guys know anything different, obviously, you know, I sat there trying to work this through my head, what was going on. And it does comfort me a little bit the way that uh, STS Turbo was saying, oh, well, you don't, you don't really need, you, all you need is a vent filter. You know, and of course, anytime someone doesn't want to vent their stuff, what do they do? They get a catch can. And I just incorporated it the way that you would a normal catch can. Because in lieu of the nipple here that this would normally be attached to, this, via way of the catch can, is still connected to a nipple on the intake where the filter would be here normally on, on naturally aspirated now it's back there filter nipple this is connected there and then it comes in well same thing back there filter the nipple is back there this hose which would be connected here is just one long hose instead of a really short one is drawing air in right so I think it's right. I'm going to run with it. Uh, I just wanted to try to use this time coming down, make everything correct and kind of work out any kind of irregularities I was seeing. But uh, so, yeah, uh, getting very close now. Next up. So we this this boost gate, this boost gauge, this three reading boost gauge that we're swapping out our one that we have already. Uh, it's got obviously boost. It has oil temperature or any temperature, but I'm using it for oil and it's got exhaust temperature. So this is the exhaust probe. And in this kit that this guy's offer you from the, from uh, glow shift, they give you the drill, they give you the tap and all that stuff. Now, I don't know how effective that's going to be here because this is really thin metal and you can only tap metal so much, uh, and ask it to give you some thread enough to screw something in. So you got to be careful if you're going to add it in there. Uh, just make sure you don't, you know, put a breaker bar on it when you're tightening it kind of scenario. But so next up, I've got to get the downpipe on. And I already kind of put this under there just now to figure out where I would put this probe. Now, on EGT sensors, you want to make sure that you put them, you put it. Now, some vehicles on my race car, I had individual uh, EGTs. But on this one here, this one has a four into two into one pipe header on it. This is the OBX header. And so to get a full understanding of what all the, if you just got one probe, they want you to read off of all the exhaust temperature. 
instead of just putting it in one because then you're only getting that cylinder's temperature. And why am I doing this? A couple reasons. Just because it came in the kit is number one, and I've got it, so why not? Uh, EGTs can help you tune. Uh, it's kind of important for timing. It'll, it'll, it'll make some changes for fuel too, but timing, you can watch that. Now, I'll be honest with you, EGTs are, are mostly, you'll see those on diesel engines for the most part. But there are on gas, and like I said, if you have the ability, your, your tuning software has the ability for individual cylinder tuning, then yes, it would make sense to do individual cylinder probes, and that way you could, you know, maybe one's running leaner, one's, one can use a little bit more timing, just whatever the reason would be, you can play with it like that. But we don't have that, even with the DET3, we don't have that. But since it comes with the, the gauge, I'm going to go ahead and utilize it. And so here, now, same thing with O2 sensors, if you're putting on an extra air fuel ratio meter, uh, whenever you're putting in your bungs and things like that, you don't want to put the sensor like at the six o'clock position, like at the bottom here, because moisture, if you've ever started your car before and you see like water drips coming out of your tailpipe, it's just the natural conversion of the air and the humidity and the heat and all this stuff that it creates moisture. And you don't want a sensor sitting right down there in the bottom of all that. So you need to either make it come in at the top, maybe at the, say the, uh, what, 10 o'clock position, two o'clock position. This, this probe here, I'm gonna make it come out right around the two o'clock position on this side. This bracket right here bolts to one of those bolts that's on that kidney-shaped engine to transmission brace. And uh, I encourage you to use that. And then, so I'm going to do that. Now, let's say that for some reason this is too too thin. I can't get it to thread up. Then I'll just have to weld a bung into there. But, um, but what we have to do now is this is that new flex tube. I've talked about it before. Hopefully, this one lasts a lot longer than the, the braided one did. So I'm going to try to be very careful and try to use some real thought in the way that the exhaust hangs inside there now so that this thing doesn't get bunched up and and uh, get damaged just because it was off center or off at a certain angle and things like that. Uh, I've tacked this in place where I thought I needed it. I'm going to have to have somebody else weld it for me. Uh, this guy here in my community, he's a welder. He'll take care of it. Um, so, and then of course, once that happens, I'll go ahead and try to drill and type it. When that happens, because I had to cut a chunk out from that old um, flex tube, I'm gonna be missing quite a bit. So with this header mounted on there, I'm, I'm probably shy about that much pipe. So I've got to get this header welded up. I've got to mount the header, put this one back on the V-band clamp then measure how much length I need after that, put the section in there, tack it, take it back off, take it back over that guy, let him weld up those tacks. Um, I have some extra pipe and stuff like that. And then I've got some, wherever all this is happening, I've got some more of this wrap that I'm going to put on there. Hopefully i got enough. Um, and then the exhaust will be done. Um, so. Well, the holdup in having a fire up video is uh, the header here. I'm going to just sweep past it real quick because it's nasty. Do you see that? It's horrible. <laughs> Man, a, a guy in the neighborhood well did these for me. Thank goodness. I've tacked this on here just now. I'm going to take it back to him, let him wet it up. He admitted, thankfully, he, I mean, he's he's honest He's an honest guy. It was done at no charge, right? So, I mean, but he welded this flex tube for me. I just got up underneath there and tacked best I could underneath the car that's barely up off the ground here. I mean, it's kind of tough to get under there with a welding hood on, not blind myself and burn myself. So I've got this portion tacked on here, here, here. And I had to tack it on there because it was in a position to where I can't guarantee that if I kind of make measures and tack it outside the car, then put it on, that it won't make exactly up where I need it. And heck, it may still not even do that. But this is where I did this just now. I ended up putting this on here. Oh my goodness, dude. I keep wondering if this little Harbor Freight welder isn't the issue because I get the concept of welding. I get the idea, 
uh, you know, you know, back and forth and you set your, your, uh, wire speed. And of course here, they've only got two options for voltage or, or whatever power it's minimum maximum. And yeah, it was $99. I bought it probably, I want to say 15. No, shoot. It's when we moved in here, dude, it's been almost 15 years since I've had this. And I barely use it. I did buy some real, what I was told was real quality wire. Uh, but again, uh, my this was to, my intention was to just tack things with this. And and then my brother was a welder or is a welder, a pipe fitter. But he lives in almost an hour and a half away. So you know, just taking it places and getting them to finish it out for me is all I've been able to do. But I had tried and. and tested and I guess played with uh, sections of metal and things like that and for for what I was doing on it for my no training whatsoever I mean I was doing pretty good but I do think it is because this doesn't have argon gas or whatever and and or whatever they you know the two bottles that are on there they buy they they sell little bitty little bottles for like I guess somebody like myself that doesn't do a whole lot of welding I may go ahead and invest in that but I couldn't do that at the time because the, they cost so much. And with me not being sure if I was just not a welder or, 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 if, or if I could be one if I had the right equipment, I ended up not getting it. But with Amazon and all these things going on, the cheap prices, I may go ahead and get one from them and, uh, and then try it with the bottles and see if I can't get better. Uh, I think I could. I just, I, I just need to know, uh, you know cheaply if I can or not. So, yeah, so I went around this. The trick is, you know, I know it's penetration. You got to make sure you get good penetration in the welds and all that stuff. Otherwise, they'll break. I think I did good, but I, I gobbed it on. and I ended up grinding a lot of that away uh, just to, you know, and I put a, put a light in here and looked for air holes. I mean, light holes and stuff like that. Saw a couple of them. Bent, kind of poked through a couple times ended up watching a video on how to remedy that and i did remedy that got those filled up so with this one tacked i'll take it over to that gentleman in the neighborhood let him put this kind of weld on here which i'm totally fine with look in the end it's exhaust it's underneath the car and it's going to be covered by this coating uh by the by the uh, the heat tape or the heat cloth and the coating so and before i even seal this up i may hit it with some high temp paint to kind of just keep it from rusting uh, these, this is all stainless steel and he admitted that, and I knew this, uh, mild steel, stainless steel, there is kind of a curve. You got to kind of understand and know how to do that type stuff. And so, oh, well, but in the end, um, that's the hold up to getting a startup video. Put that exhaust on here and hopefully next update, that'll be it. Be able to start it up and take the next step.